Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. We continue our study in the book of Jeremiah. Today we're going to be starting in chapter 19, the broken flask. But before we do that, let's pray together. Dear Lord, I just thank you for your word. I ask for a special word for each person that's listening to this. Help us to get your heart through this message, Lord. And Lord, I just claim that promise that your word does not return void, but will accomplish its purpose. Now, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to be with each of the prayer requests that are on people's hearts, those that have lost loved ones, those that are carrying heavy burdens, Lord, those that have been ill, and those that are just having issues, Lord, that are heavy on their heart. And I lift each one of them up to you, and you know who it is who needs to hear a word from you, God. Speak to them through your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, continue the... The study in Jeremiah chapter 19, the broken flask. Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priest and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the pot's herd gate, and proclaim there the words which I tell you and say, Hear the word of the Lord. O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such catastrophe on this place that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle. So basically God has Jeremiah gather the leaders and bring them outside the gate, the walls of the city, to this place called the Potsherd Gate, and then also to where a place is called the Valley of Hinnom. Jesus referred to this as Gehenna. He referred to it as hell because it's a garbage dump. And what happens is people would, and the Potsherd Gate is sometimes called the Dung Gate or the Refuse Gate because it's where everyone would take and drop their garbage in this place. And it was always on fire. And uh, they had these worms that, would come out to the garbage. And so that's why Jesus said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He compared hell to this place. So the gate is right outside where the potters were. That's why they called it the pot's herd gate. A pot's herd is basically a piece of pottery that's been broken. It's, it's what archaeologists find a lot of. But <clears throat> when, when Jesus referred on the cross... And he said, "My, this was in is recorded in Psalm 22. It said, my mouth is dried up like a pot's herd. What he was saying is, this is a dry old piece of pottery that all the moisture has been sucked out of it. And so that's the way Jesus felt on the cross. So he suffered just like that, just like the pot's herd. Also, Job used it to, to scrape his sores when he, when he had this disease when, when his, his faith was being tested. So a pot's herd gate is it's referring to the place where the potters were and they would take their broken pieces and throw them or their broken jars that were no longer good, throw them in this place. So this was, like I said, a garbage dump. So it says here that because they have forsaken me, so Jeremiah brings the people out to teach them a lesson, and he has this, this clay jar with him that was made by the potter. And it says, Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense to it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers nor their kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence, they also have built high places to Baal, to burn their sons and with fire for the burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, or did it even come to my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no, be, no more be called Tophet, or the Valley of Hinnom, but it shall be called the Valley of Slaughter. So basically he's saying, God is judging you. And he's saying, this place he said, was a place of child sacrifice. I mean, horrible. In fact, Jesus, God even says to him, this wouldn't even have come to my mind. You know, this is so 
opposite of what God wants. And so they were, they were sacrificing to Molech and these other gods and Baal worship. And they would do it right there where this, this gate was and the fire was. And it, it was just a horrible sight and what God would do. And I guess that's why he referred to it as hell. But God hates child sacrifice. He said, you know, in fact, it says there's seven, six things the Lord hates. Yea, seven are abomination. And one of them is shedding innocent blood you know, sacrificing children that are not guilty. And so, you know, it's so such a sick thing that was going on. So because of this, it says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming that it'll be no longer called Tophet. Now, the name of Tophet actually means fireplace, just like the hell, you know, a fire that isn't quenched. Or the valley of Hinnom, but it'll be called the valley of slaughter because God says, I'm going to bring such judgment on this place that you'll be calling it the Valley of Slaughter because of the judgment that comes because of all these detestable things you practiced to these false gods. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpse will be Meat for the birds of the heaven and beasts of the earth. I will make this city desolate and a hissing everyone that passes by. It will be astonished and hissed because of all its plagues. The hissing really means people are amazed. It's like they say things under their breath because it's like, wow, this is, this is horrible. And, you know, it's like when they see these things, they, they can't understand what's going on. But, uh, he goes on and he says that their counsel, he'll make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. In other words, the things that they have promised, the things that they say will be made null and void. They won't mean anything. And, and so that's what he's, he's doing here. Then I'm going to skip down a verse. And it says, In the desperation with which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. Then it says, Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people in this city as one breaks the potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. Thus I will do to this place, says the Lord, and to its inhabitants." And make this city like Tophet or a fireplace. So he's, he tells Jeremiah, now break this jar. And, and when he breaks it, it breaks, it breaks into pieces and it can no longer be repaired. And so he's saying, just like this broken vessel, you're going to be broken. You know, and, it, and just like this, you know, the inhabitants of the people that will be buried in this area but he's saying the vessel that God made to be honorable to him is now broken and he's going to shatter it in this area. Thus I will do to this place, says the Lord and its inhabitants, and make the city like Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet because of all the houses on whose roofs they have burned incense to all the host of heaven and poured out drink offerings to other gods. So as God looked down, he saw people offering on their rooftops these sacrifices to other gods. And so it, it was like the whole place is just turned to other gods. And, and so he says they too will, will see this whole, the whole city of Jerusalem will become a fireplace like Tophet. Then Jeru Jeremiah came from Tophet, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house, and he said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on this city and on her towns the doom that I pronounce against it, because they are stiff-necked, their necks that they might not hear the word, my words. So he has Jeremiah go and re repeat it in the courtyard, because not even people didn't want to hear his word. They wouldn't go with him to hear this example. So he had to go back and explain it again. But he's saying, because they are stiff-necked people. You know, he said that a lot about the people in the wilderness before they entered the promised land. Because they're stiff-necked, they're set in their ways. They won't listen to God. They won't listen to reason. 
They won't yield to God's purposes. And so they're, they're set in their ways and they're willing to do whatever it takes that they want to do. Chapter 20. Now Pasher, the son of Emar, the priest who was also the chief governor of the house of God, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So Jeremiah gets punished for telling this. I mean, the people, you know, they don't want to hear what he has to say, even though it's the truth. And so this guy named Pasher, he comes out, he's a priest for the chief governor, and he says, he, he, he strikes Jeremiah and he puts him in stocks. And I, this picture shows kind of what it was like. Your feet and your hands are bound and your head's bound. And people would come by and mock you and make fun of you. And you were called a laughing stock. And that's what they would do. So Jeremiah was persecuted for his faith and for telling the truth. And it happened on the next day that Pasher brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then Jeremiah said to him, the Lord has not called your name Pasher, but Magar Mizabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. Pasher means peace or something like that, but the new name he's given means terror on every side. He will see the terror come uh, to the city. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver the wealth of the city, all its produce, all of its precious things, all of the treasures of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hand of their enemies, who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house, shall go to captivity. You shall go to Babylon and there you shall die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. So he said, you too will suffer the persecution that comes. You'll be carried away into a, a land that is not yours. You and all your friends that prophesy and you're going to be buried there. You're going to die there. You're not even going to die in your homeland. And so Jeremiah now goes to the Lord and talks to the Lord about this persecution. And he says, O oh Lord, and you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and I have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me just like in the, in the stocks. Everyone comes by and, and yells insults at me. And that's the way Jesus felt on the cross, very similar. For when I spoke, I cried out and I, said, and I shouted, Violence and plunder. Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Because of the word of the Lord, he was persecuted. But then he says this. He says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak his name anymore. In other words, he's saying, Okay, I'm not going to talk about God anymore. I'm not going to say the words God tells me because it just gets me punished. But then listen to this. This is powerful. Now, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, I was weary of holding it back, and I couldn't. <laughs> For I heard many mocking fear on every side. Report, they said, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. In other words, they said, if we persecute him enough, if we say enough words about him, if we put him in stocks enough and, and punish him for what he says, maybe he'll back off and we don't have to hear him anymore. But Jeremiah has something they don't have. He has the fire of God inside of him. And the word of God is burning in his heart and he said he can't resist sharing it because it's just something he has to get. And he has to share because it's, it's something that's so passionate with him. Just like when people know the Lord and they're passionate for God, they can't help but share it or bless other people or try to win other people to Christ because they know how great it is. 
So the word of God is sharp and living and powerful. And it was living in him. <laughs> and it was a fire in his soul that he had to share. And he couldn't stop from sharing it. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Now he's praising God. And he says, Therefore my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my cause before you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of the evildoers. So now Jeremiah breaks out in praise. You know, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know how God compensates for the persecution, and I know the pain is felt. But Paul and Silas sang in a Roman jail in Philippi, and, and they sang praises to God after they had been beaten with many stripes. And Stephen's face shined as an angel when he was being stoned to death. There's something inside, burning inside, that, that gives you a hope. And so Jeremiah breaks out in praise. But this part about he's the one that tests the righteous and he sees the mind and the heart. In other words, God reads our heart and he knows whether we have a good heart or not. But he also looks at our mind because that's where the warfare is. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart and our motivation for doing things. And that's where a lot of the evil thoughts and things come from. But at the same time, God wants to change your mind by the transforming of your mind. So when you get a new heart, you can get a new mind. He will renew your mind and make you a new person. And so he tests our heart and our mind to know what's really inside of man. Okay, now I'm going to go to chapter 21. Jerusalem's doom is sealed. Then the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. When King Zedekiah sent to him, Pasher, the son of Melchiah, that's a different Pasher. They're, they had people with the same name because it had a different father. And Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. So, Zedekiah was the king appointed. He wasn't born into the kingdom. He was appointed by the king of Babylon. And so he's king now. And, and it's interesting that all these other prophets he doesn't want to hear from anymore. And why is that? Because <laughs> the king of Babylon's already attacking them and they see it coming. And so he knows Jeremiah is the only one, but he's, he's saying, look, you guys go, go ask Jeremiah, ask him for a good word. Maybe God's going to give us a good word instead of a bad word. Maybe he's going to turn back the king of Babylon. Please tell Jeremiah, I want, I want a good word. <laughs> and so it says, then Jeremiah said to them, thus you shall say to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls. And I will assemble them in the midst of the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm. Even in anger and fury and great wrath, I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people, and such as left in this city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, nor have pity or mercy. So he didn't get the good report he wanted, but he got the same message Jeremiah had been preaching forever. No, in fact, God's going to fight against you. He's going to be with the king of Babylon. And he's going to destroy you and overtake you. And the, the, the people will be carried away into captivity. And many will die of the pestilence and famine and sword. 
And he said, those people that don't go into captivity like King Zedekiah, who thought they could stay in Jerusalem, they will be put into the hand of King of Babylon to do with them as they will. And he did end up dying. And, and so he had a terrible end. But what Jeremiah said was true. So they didn't get the word they wanted. Now you shall say this to the people, thus saith the Lord. Oh, this is good too. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. You have a choice. You can go the path of life or you can go the path of death. He who remains in the city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live. And his life shall be a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and it shall be burned with fire. So here he's, he's testifying and says, okay, tell the people, you have a choice. You have the way of life or the way of death. And he says, if you stay here, you're going to die of one of three methods, pestilence, famine, or sword. Or you can go into captivity, which is what the Lord was calling them to do, because that way they would get their hearts right the city would be burned and the, the gates and the walls torn down and the temple destroyed because of, of the sin, the purge, the sin that was in the land. But those that went there that returned to God would be the remnant. And he said, that's the way of life. However, because all their treasures and all their money and all their land's going to be taken, they're going to just prize their life. Those that go into captivity will be happy just to get out of there with their life. But that is the way of life, and that's the way, the choice they have. I set up before you the path of life or the path of death. So the message to the house of David, and concerning the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear the word of the Lord, the house of David, thus saith the Lord. So this is a message to the king of Judah. Execute judgment in the morning and deliver him who was plundered out of the hand of the oppressor lest my fury go forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So he's saying, do what is right. Don't oppress people. Do what's right. Do justice. And, 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 uh, and, and he says, if you, if you don't do that, his fury is going to come out and burn uh, the place to where it won't be quenched. Behold, I am against you, O inhabitant of the valley, and rock of the plain, says the Lord, who say, who shall come against down against us, or who shall enter the dwellings? But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, says the Lord. In other words, your own works will judge you. The own fruit of your your what you do will be you will be punished for. I will kindle a fire in the forest, and it shall devour all things around it. Then I'm going to read a little bit of chapter twenty two. Uh, which kind of is following the same thought of the house of David. Thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants, and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, Execute judgment and righteousness. Deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall you enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people and kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus saith the Lord to the king, house of the king of Judah, so what he's saying here is he's saying, take care of the stranger. Be nice to the stranger. Don't oppress anyone. It says, take care of the widows and don't shed any more innocent blood. And he says, if you do these things, you, your name will carry on and you will be welcome in this place because you are doing what's right and following the Lord. But if you don't, then your name will be a desolation and it'll be gone forever. 
For thus saith the Lord to the king of Judah, You are Gilead to me, the head of the head of Lebanon. Yet I surely I will make you a wilderness, cities which are not inhabited. I will prepare destroyers against you, every one with his weapon. They shall cut down your choice cedars and cast them in the fire. So now he's he's saying he's saying here you used to be Gilead. Now Gilead we we know of the it was the place of the balm of Gilead, and and it was a healing ointment in it. Many people would come to receive the balm of Gilead and trade there to get this special healing balm they would put, an ointment. And he says, you were supposed to be that way for me. This, this, this land, the promised land, was supposed to be a Gilead for other nations, to be called to, to, to honor God, to be healing to others. But you have changed it. And he says, and you will end up being a wilderness and you won't even have cities that are inhabited anymore. And then he says, the destroyer will come through and he will cut down all your choice cedars. Your land will be devastated and he will cast them into the fire. And many nations will pass by this city and everyone will say to his neighbor, why has the Lord done this to this great city? Then they will answer because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them. There's always a reason for the judgment. Weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him. Weep bitterly for him who goes away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. Judgment is hard, but it's to bring back the redeemed and the remnant who will have a heart for God. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Let's pray together. Thank you for your word, Lord. Help us to heed the call of Jeremiah. Help us to to have that same fire in our soul like he had for the word of God and for others and to be willing to share the truth. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.